Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Thomas Cochran, Craziest Sea Captain in History. I will be breaking this into a three-part series, since the original video is about an hour and 20 minutes long. So this will be part one. So, I don't know too much about Thomas Cochran. I'm really excited to learn about him. I know from what I've heard, plus the title of this video, that he was a Scottish sea captain who participated in the Napoleonic Wars, amongst many others, and was known for his daring exploits. Sounds pretty interesting to me. Always love to learn about either Scottish history or Scottish people in history. Of course, I'm Scottish myself, so I think this will be a good one. Before we get into this one, I would appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or becoming a channel member. Either of those will get you exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump into this reaction. All right, let's go. Thomas Cochran. Sometimes the life of a single man can be utterly extraordinary. Such is the case of a certain 19th century Scottish madman <laughs> whose daring exploits played a crucial role in defeating Napoleon, but also made him a revolutionary war hero in Chile, Peru, and Brazil. Wow. A 19th century Scottish madman. Those are words I always like to hear. I feel like in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, we have a lot of very prominent Scottish explorers, generals, captains, um, both in British history and global history. I mean, if we look at the American War of Independence, there were a lot of Scottish soldiers on both sides of the war. So, you know, that's something I always like to keep an eye on. Yet also, a man whose utter stubbornness made him the enemy of every superior officer he ever served under. <laughs> Welcome to our documentary Sounds Scottish on Lord Thomas Cochrane the single most insane sea captain of the age of sail. <laughs> wow, the okay. The sponsor of today's video is Sleep Theory. A They're really hyping this guy up, but uh, I am excited to get into it. Um, as usual, please check out Kings and Generals' video. It's linked down below. Leave them a like, subscribe to their channel, check out their sponsor, show them support for making these fantastic Sleep Theory to videos. our viewers, and this is how you install it. Support our channel and improve your sleep habits by pressing the link in the description or the pinned comment. Sweet dreams. Nice. Thomas Cochrane was born in 1775 in Ansfield, Scotland, to Anna Cochrane and the 9th Earl of Dundon. He's from around uh, a similar area I was born. He was born in sort of the, the Glasgow area. I was also born a little bit outside Glasgow. Old Archibald Cochrane. The Cochranes were the direct descendants of a lowland Scottish clan, whose origins are traced to a Viking warrior from around the 9th century, and the name itself is derived from an old Gaelic portmanteau, meaning the roar of battle. Hmm. The Cochranes had a long history of military service to the British Empire. Members of the clan had fought and died in the War of Spanish Succession, served as loyalists during the Jacobite Rebellion, mm. and even partook in the French and Indian Wars in the New World. Yeah, so, you know, these are lowland Scots, um, which is what I am, though the distinction isn't too relevant these days, which means they're from the lowlands, or sort of the southern part of Scotland, uh, in contrast to, say, highland Scots. Now, when we talk about this era, uh, particularly if we talk about events like the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. It's often framed as this big Scotland versus England conflict, and the whole era is portrayed as Scots versus English. Except it's not exactly true. Oftentimes, the Highland Scots were on the opposite side of the Lowland Scots. The Lowland Scots would often side with the Brits. They would stay loyal to the British government, where the Highland Scots would team up with, say, the French to fight against, you know, both the English and their fellow Scots, but just lowland Scots. So, you know, there's actually a lot more inter-Scottish fighting during this time period than a lot of people generally believe. And the family was affectionately nicknamed the Fighting Cochranes. From hmm. a young age, Thomas wished to add to the Cochranes fighting legacy by joining the Navy. But against his wishes, his father had him enlisted in the 104th Regiment of the King's Army. Mm. The young Scot hated army life, particularly the rigid dress code, stating this in his autobiography. 
my hair, cherished with boyish pride, was plastered back with a vile composition <laughs> of candle grease and flour. My neck, from childhood open to the lowland breeze, was cased in an inflexible leathern collar. Interesting. I mean, look, life at sea, being part of the Navy, that also took a, a lot of discipline, but it was certainly a little bit more open than life in the Army was. Um, I mean, there's more choice about how you go about things, uh, and also, he seems like a man who clearly wanted the freedom of the open sea, uh, even though, you know, naval life was pretty regimented too. Uh, I can see how that would appeal to him more than being an officer in the army. Cochrane fled back to his father, begging him to send him to sea, rather than spend one more day in the army. This was the first time Cochrane showed defiance in the face of authority, and it would become a theme for the rest of his life. Hmm. On July 28, 1793, Thomas Cochrane entered the Royal Navy as a midshipman. Wow, okay, so um, I, I knew around the time period he lived, but he only entered the Navy in 1793, so post-French Revolution. So, you know, he's really getting into naval affairs just as things are kicking off. It's only a couple of years before Napoleon will rise and we'll get the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and, you know, France is already fighting with its neighbors uh, over its borders in the revolution, so a pretty young guy at this point. It was a position that he earned largely due to his family's influence. At 17, he was a few years older than most other midshipmen. Nevertheless, mm. he made the most of his late start, eagerly learning every intricacy of naval life, impressing his superiors with his natural leadership abilities and voracious curiosity. Mm. Cochrane had joined the Royal Navy when trouble was brewing on the continent. Yep. The French king, Louis XVI, had recently lost during the revolution, and the newly established French Republic had declared war upon monarchies of Europe that would seek to reimpose a king on them. Thus, much of Cochrane's naval career was defined by war with the French and their Spanish allies. Yep, as he joined the Navy, the French Revolutionary Wars had just broken out, uh, as France made an effort to defend its revolution and also fight back against the monarchies of Europe. Um, France certainly wanted to export its revolutionary ideas, but they were basically also under siege by many of their neighbors. Um, and there would be some back and forth early on. Uh, it would go pretty well for the French, and then, of course, we eventually get to Napoleon, uh, and, you know, he really improves France's chances uh, of winning these conflicts, and by improves, I mean he conquers a good chunk of Europe, which revolutionary France uh, never managed to do, though they did have some very successful conquests even before Napoleon. Cochrane spent much of his first two years of service on the 38-gun frigate HMS Thetis, where he was promoted to acting lieutenant. Thetis was active on the eastern seaboard of the United States, seizing American merchant ships bound for French harbors. Hmm. After four years in North America... Yeah, there was a lot of conflict between the United States uh, and Britain and the United States and France during this period. There was sort of a so-called quasi-war between the U.S. and France. Um, you know, the United States wanted to continue trading with France and Britain. They wanted to stay neutral regarding the warfare in Europe. Neither France and Britain liked this, so this led to some sort of low-level naval warfare with France um, and a lot of conflict with Britain, which would eventually lead to the War of 1812. We've got a while to go before that, but basically there were sort of small-scale engagements between uh, American merchant ships um, and, and naval ships and the British and French navies during this period. On various vessels, Cochrane returns to Britain in 1798. By then, the European war front had become more dire. Mm. A Corsican artillery officer <laughs> by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte yep had risen through the smoke and blood of the revolution to become a general devastating the British allies. Bonaparte had his eyes set upon an invasion of Britain itself, and the only thing standing in his way was the Royal Navy's dominance at sea. And, I mean, as it ended up, the Royal Navy would really prove its dominance, uh, and, and they would rule the seas for a long time after this. But Napoleon was exactly right <laughs> that Britain was his main problem. 
you know, for as long as, you know, revolutionary France and France under Napoleon lasted, Britain would oppose them, at times militarily, uh, and always, and this might have been even more harmful, economically. You know, Britain would smuggle its goods into Europe, it would try and block trade with France, and so this was a thorn in the side of the French for the entire time until Napoleon abdicated. So he is right that Britain is the main problem, but he's just unable to solve it, you know? He cannot manage to invade Britain. The Royal Navy is too powerful. Meanwhile, other big names among British seamen were making names for themselves, as Britain was still celebrating Horatio Nelson's victory over the French at the Battle of the Nile. This only further invigorated the fighting Scot to seek out glory of his own. Mm. Luckily, Cochrane's connections in the Scottish aristocracy managed to get him appointed as an 8th lieutenant aboard the HMS Barfleur, flagship of the British fleet in the Mediterranean, captained by the acting admiral, Lord Keith. For around a year, Cochrane served as part of a fleet of 15 ships operating off the coast of southern Spain, managing to keep a fleet of 20 Spanish warships blockaded in Cadiz. Meanwhile, many of Cochrane's peers resented the relative speed at which he had advanced in the ranks, and this enmity would soon come to a boil. Yeah, well, you know, this is very characteristic of systems of hierarchy during this period, whether they be military or civil, which is that to advance through these systems, um, sometimes you had to be an aristocrat, or more often, being an aristocrat would guarantee quick advancement upwards. I mean, this was one of the reasons that the French Revolution had happened, is that the opportunities for advancement uh, in, say, the civil service or the military were oftentimes blocked off to non-aristocrats, even wealthy middle-class individuals who just weren't born into the aristocracy. And so we're seeing sort of an example of that here. Now, as it happened, Thomas Cochrane would end up being very talented, so he wasn't some rich aristocratic fail son who, you know, just got promoted upwards and upwards, purely based on his aristocratic background, but that is sort of what got him there in the first place. He's going to have to prove himself, but from what I've heard about him, and from how they've set this up, it seems like he is going to prove himself. The young Scot found himself butting heads with the Barfleur's first lieutenant, Philip Beaver. Supposedly, Beaver had confronted Cochrane for reporting himself aboard the ship late after a period of shore leave. Cochrane's prideful nature got the better of him, complaining that he had only been late because he had to change his muddied clothes. Hmm. For quarrelling with his superior, he found himself court-martialed. He was offered an opportunity to apologise to Beaver, but refused. Nevertheless, he was still acquitted by Lord Keith, but the incident would cost him. He was now on his admiral's bad side. In January of 1800, the Mediterranean fleet was dispatched to Italy to join forces with Horatio Nelson. While ashore on Sicily, Cochrane had the opportunity to meet Britain's most famous admiral. Nelson was a celebrity, and Cochrane looked up to him. Yep, and Nelson is remembered even today, a very famous military figure in Britain history, uh, in British history. Cochrane's autobiography mentions a particularly laconic piece of advice given to him by Nelson. Never mind maneuvers, always go at them. Cochrane <laughs> would take this advice to heart. Okay. A month later, Nelson seized a squadron of French ships off Malta, and Cochrane was tasked with delivering one of the prize frigates into British hands at Fort Mahon through enemy infested waters. A storm nearly sunk his quarry, but he prevailed. For his success, he was promoted and appointed commander of the HMS Speedy. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> Great name, by the way, HMS Speedy. <laughs> Speedy was a tiny sloop equipped with only oh. a handful of four-pounder cannons, which Cochrane called a species of gun little larger than a blunderbuss. <laughs> Cochrane even found his new living quarters impossibly cramped, with barely room to stand straight, sit properly, or even shave. It is possible that this appointment was a form of punishment by Lord Keith, who mm. hoped to shackle the impudent Cochrane to a small, insignificant vessel, dooming him into obscurity. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's an interesting move, though it's clear Cochrane wants more from his career, from his life. In some way, you know, he is an aristocrat. He's clearly accustomed to a good way of life. He wants to maintain that. But he is also clearly an ambitious man, 
who won't take no from anybody. He wants to do things, and he will do them, uh, even if it means standing up to his superiors and, and getting in trouble, and perhaps getting in his own way. If this was truly the intention, it would end up backfiring spectacularly. The path of destruction that Thomas Cochrane would embark upon commanding this vessel would be the first of many adventures that would cement him into legend. Hmm. The journey of the HMS Speedy began on April 22nd of 1800 with an immediate success. Cochrane was a mere month into his first cruise when he captured a French privateer vessel off the coast of Cagliari. Within the next three months, three more small vessels were captured, while dozens more were harried, which put Cochrane back in the good graces of his superiors. Wow. Cochrane regarded his early conquests as modest, as he had larger ambitions. <laughs> We've got a real sort of classic British sea dog, you know, sort of this image that you have of this time period and earlier times, whether they be privateers, uh, part of the Royal Navy, or even pirates of the sort of scrappy British officer uh, who only has his small ship but is aggressive and manages to take out and capture enemy vessels at a very impressive rate. So far, Cochrane is sort of embodying that archetype. Following winter, Cochrane really began to employ his legendary cunning. His sloop had been patrolling the eastern Spanish coast for the better part of December, mm. and on the 21st of that month, came upon a vessel they perceived to be a well-laden Spanish merchant. Speedy drew closer to investigate, only for the target to raise its gun ports, revealing itself as a frigate of war. Uh oh Cochrane had no intention to risk battle with a vessel far superior in firepower to his, nor was his tiny brig able to outsail the foe. Luckily, he had space and time to spare. He ordered his ship painted to resemble a Danish brig, and brought a Danish-speaking quartermaster on deck. He instructed the quartermaster to tell the Spaniards the Speedy was plague-ridden, and that spooked the frigate away. Oh, that's great. Not only is he an aggressive fighter, uh, but he's smart. You know, he's the type of guy you want in a military context. Someone who's able to think his way around problems. Presented with, you know, a situation and two different options. Uh, we don't know much about him yet, but it seems like Cochrane is the kind of guy who makes a third option. He makes his own way. That, that's a very funny solution, and a very smart solution, an intelligent piece of trickery. It wouldn't be the last time the cunning commander would employ false colors, as Cochrane kept a collection of various flags mm. aboard his ships for much of his career. The next few months saw Cochrane's successes continue to pile. Capturing an armed warship is very difficult, yet Cochrane achieved that regularly. Wow. His deceptive cunning and clever use of false flags was the key to his success. Mm. HMS Speedy traveled at night and attacked at dawn. Her small size allowed her to strike fast and slip away undetected. One notable engagement saw Cochrane once more fly a Danish flag to approach a French and a Spanish brig off the coast of Catalonia. His prey never suspected a thing, and Speedy closed in for the catch, hoisting British colors and capturing both vessels and all 54 Man. men aboard. No task is too big for him, huh? Prevented, presented with two enemy vessels, he's going to go straight for it. I respect that. Um, especially if it works out, which it has been. Cochrane was now known both by his countrymen and their enemies, as his autobiography notes that Speedy's success had made him a marked object of the Spanish naval authorities. I'm sure. His reputation as a maverick would only grow, most notably within the gilded halls of high society. In February of 1801, the young commander purchased a ticket for a fancy ball in Malta, hosted by some aristocratic French royalists in exile. Mm. Cochrane dressed himself for the occasion in a British sailor's garb he described <laughs> as as honourable a character as Greek, Turkish and other oriental disguises in vogue. Nevertheless, he was barred entry at the gates, his outfit considered too rustic. A heated argument ensued with a French officer, followed by a challenge to a duel. Oh my. The following morning, the pair met with pistols in hand. Cochrane shot the Frenchman through the waist, while he himself passed unscathed. Jeez. Co yeah, I'm not surprised that Cochrane's already gotten into a duel. I thought we honestly might have seen more up until this point. You know, he is uh, seemingly a pretty stubborn guy. He's not willing to back down. He's also a pretty eccentric character. 
So in times like that, he's going to be presented with a lot of challenges, which he, you know, refuses to back down. So at a time like this, and these sort of social situations, uh, that's going to lead you to duels, for example. Cochrane put back to sea later that month. It was business as usual once more aboard HMS Speedy, as it returned to harrying the vessels of Napoleon and Spain on the coasts of the Mediterranean. By the morning of May 6th of 1801, Speedy had already captured or sunk 17 vessels off the Spanish coast and was now cruising the coasts of Barcelona. Okay. There, she came across a peculiar vessel on the horizon and tacked on the breeze to investigate. As it turned out, it was the El Gamo, a Zebec-class Spanish frigate, which likely had been deployed specifically to eliminate the menace that was Speedy. Hmm. Cochrane knew his situation was dire, as Gamo was a heavy warship bearing 32 cannon and 319 crewmen. Whoa. Speedy, on the other hand, had only 54 hands on deck and 14 cannons, which lacked power and range. Admiral Nelson's words rang true in the daring Scotsman's mind. Never mind maneuvers, always go at them. Okay. Cochrane ordered his crew to hoist an American flag and make directly for the Gamo. The Spaniards had- This man has just got his collection of flags. He's just pulling up any flag that's useful. Uh, we've got an American flag now. Hell yeah. Hesitated, unwilling to risk a diplomatic incident by firing on what could be a neutral vessel. Ooh. This allowed Cochrane to approach so close to Gamo that he could see the whites of her crew's eyes. Speedy's yardarm locked with Gamo's rigging, and from there, the jig was up, and Cochrane gave the order to let fly. The Union Jack was hoisted, and Speedy unleashed a deadly broadside cannonade at point-blank range. I will say I like the uh, eventual hauling of the Union Jack that's always taken during these battles. Uh, I think, to be fair, that is sort of common naval etiquette of the time. You know, you can use false flags, but once you get into battle, you're supposed to hoist your own country's flag. Uh, that was commonly done, but it's kind of funny that, you know, you've done the trickery, um, you know, you're in battle, and now you're like, wait, we have to hoist our flag, get it up there. <laughs> Her guns had been elevated and unleashed destruction upon the Spanish deck, killing Gamo's captain in the first blast. Speedy's proximity made it so her foe's cannon fired harmlessly over her short deck. Musket fire proved an ineffective tool as well in picking off the battle-hardened British crew. Mm. Twice the Spaniards attempted a boarding party, and twice Speedy veered out of range and fired another broadside. Cochrane soon realized it was time for the coup de grace, stating, Our rigging being cut up and the Speedy sails riddled with shot, I told the men that they must either take the frigate or be themselves <laughs> wow. taken. I mean, look, that's sort of a do or die situation. Uh, I mean, he's gotten he's gotten the upper hand. He's managed to trick his opponents, but now with a crew that is so much smaller than the crew he's up against, they're going to have to storm this ship and take it if they want to make it. If they want to survive or if they want to not be taken prisoner. You know, you've got a lot at risk here. But at this point you've not got much of a choice. And so, Speedy once more latched onto Gamo, and Cochrane and his crew blackened their faces with soot so as to appear more terrifying. From there, <laughs> the British boarded the frigate from the bow and stern, a fierce melee of pistols, axes, and cutlasses ensuing, with wow. Cochrane at the center of it all. Of course. Always a yeah, this is not the type of guy who's going to command from the back. If they're boarding this ship, if they're charging in... Of course, he is absolutely going to be in the middle of it. <laughs> Quick thinker, the daring commander ordered his men to haul down the Spanish flag flapping over the mainmast. This was a brutal strike to Spanish morale, for mm. they now believed their officers had given up the ship and laid down their arms to wow. surrender. You know, so far we've got a long part of the video to go, but what I like about Cochrane so far, of course he's brave, he's daring, he's willing to charge right in, but he always keeps his head. You know, he's always got an idea of what to do next. He's always got something cunning, some trick that he wants to play. And I appreciate that. Someone brave, someone daring, but someone who's also thinking at the same time. Gamo was taken as a prize and sailed to Fort Mahon. Following that, Speedy continued upon its cruise of destruction. By July of 1801, she had captured, sank, or ran aground a mind-boggling 53 enemy ships, Incredible. becoming the scourge of the Mediterranean. And yet, all things must come to an end. 
In the end, it took three massive French ships of the line bearing over 70 guns each to capture the tiny sloop, cornering her off the coast of Alicante. Wow. Cochrane was taken aboard one of the warships, Desay, and presented his sword to the captain. The Frenchman declined out of respect for his foe, saying he would not take the sword of an officer who he had for so many hours struggled against him, possibly. Wow, okay. I'm surprised I haven't mer heard more of Cochrane before. I mean, I'm somewhat familiar with the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolution, though perhaps not the naval side of it, but, you know, men like Nelson are very famous. I haven't heard that much about Cochrane, maybe because instead of being involved in some of the bigger battles, you know, he's doing his own thing, taking one or two ships at a time, but just doing it frequently. <laughs> so less big events, but just constant harassing of the enemy, which of course in the long term can have just as much a negative effect on, you know, the French and Spanish forces. Cochrane's captors treated him with kindness, and the Scotsman in particular notes the French Admiral, Charles Alexandre Linois, who held him in high regard and often asked him for nautical advice. <laughs> Cochrane witnessed the British defeat at the Battle of Algeciras from the deck of the Desay before he was eventually released in a prisoner exchange and sent to Gibraltar. Mm. On July 18, 1801, Thomas Cochrane stood aboard the deck of the 80-gun HMS Pompey to face a military court for the capture of HMS Speedy. What? However, he knew that the slew of unlikely victories he had won on his little sloop outweighed the cost of its eventual loss. Yeah, I mean, there's no... Yeah, no chance. Sure, he did eventually lose his ship and he was captured, but with the amount of victories and success that he has brought the Royal Navy, you know, you can't punish him for that, can you? <laughs> sure enough, Cochrane was honorably acquitted. All right, there we go. With that out of the way, he had expected three things. A swift promotion to post-captain, a shiny new frigate to command, and a return to the bountiful fame of Napoleonic warfare. Yeah, I mean, I would think, you know, you gave him this small little vessel, and he has been incredibly successful. A man like that, yeah, give him more men, a more impressive ship, and see what he can do with that, right? Unfortunately, none of this would come to pass. What? The Royal Navy brass dragged their feet, and for three months he watched rival officers get promoted ahead of him. Mm. Although he was finally appointed post-captain on August 8th, he had become resentful towards the British Admiralty, publicly berating the Lord Admiral St. Vincent, an act which would earn him ire from the aristocratic oligarchy that was British naval command. Yeah, I'm gonna say, I mean, we talked about earlier how, you know, Cochrane's roots and connections sort of got him this position in the first place, but, you know, he's so sort of out there uh, and so willing to speak his mind in a way that I would imagine is very socially unacceptable in the aristocratic military circles of the time that his advancement is sort of being blocked by the resentment developing between him uh, and the aristocratic leadership of the Navy, and that resentment is going both ways. On May 18th, 1803, Britain declared war on Napoleonic France once more. Mm -hmm. Cochrane, who had been unemployed during a year-long truce, was delighted to finally be deployed. Unfortunately, his ill-advised aggressions had come back to haunt him, as the vengeful Lord St. Vincent saw to it that the new post-captain was stiffed again. Mm. Cochrane was appointed to command the HMS Arab, a destitute sixth-rate frigate which he equated to a flat-bottomed cargo hauler rather than a Royal Navy warship. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, during this time period, one of the frustrations of uh, a lot of non-aristocrats, a lot of bourgeois middle-class individuals in the military, was that advancement was so based on these aristocratic ties. Now, Cochrane has somewhat benefited from that at the beginning of his career, but now he's suffering from the fact that it's so based on connections and social norms, um, and he's really not fitting <laughs> into many of those social norms. And so, despite the fact that he's very talented, he's being stiffed, right? He's not getting the promotions or and the positions he deserves, um, which I can imagine is probably incredibly frustrating. Lamenting that she would sail like a haystack. Uh. For the next year, Cochrane was relegated to patrolling Northern Europe, remarking that it was literally naval exile in a tub. 
However, yeah. in May 1804, St. Vincent was replaced by Lord Melville, who had more appreciation for Cochrane's achievements, mm. and in autumn gave Cochrane command of a vessel worthy of his talents, the HMS Palace. She was a brand new, top of the line, fifth rate Thames class frigate, armed with 36 cannons. Her deck was nearly twice as long as the HMS Speedy, okay. and had a crew capacity thrice as large. He's upgraded. Palace was a sleek weapon of destruction. By the turn of 1806, HMS Palace had become an infamous menace to both mm. France and Spain. In one cruise along the Azor Islands, she had captured four Spanish treasure galleons heavily laden with New World silver, <laughs> depriving the Spanish treasury of millions of dollars worth of capital. Cochrane was then deployed to the coasts around... And, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, at this point, I mean, at this point, it's been hundreds of years since the Age of Exploration began, since Columbus first set out on his voyage... But Spain is basically completely reliant on that New World silver. I mean, that's what made them such an empire in the first place. Uh, and the inflation and their reliance is sort of what has caused their decline. Um, you know, they've been in decline for a while uh, at, at this point, by the point of the Napoleonic Wars. So that's going to be a big loss for them. They're so reliant on that silver. Uh, and, you know, unsurprisingly... Thomas Cochrane made such a name for himself with the Speedy, now with HMS Palace, he's doing the same thing, just on a larger scale. ...and the Bay of Biscay, where he harried a dozen more French vessels. Palace's most noteworthy action came on the 5th of April, 1806. Cochrane heard word of a squadron of French corvettes anchored down the estuary of the Garonne River. The waters and coastline did not make open battle favourable, Thus, Cochrane waited patiently for nightfall and anchored his frigate at the mouth of the river estuary. Mm. From there, he appointed his lieutenant, John Haswell, to take 180 of his crewmen and embark upon the boarding boats, rowing up river along the shoreline under cover of darkness. <laughs> sure enough, this boarding party came upon a ship at anchor, Tapageuse, a 14-gun corvette serving as a guard ship for the rest of the French vessels upstream. At 3 a.m., the crew of the palace launched themselves upon Tapageuse, catching wow. the Frenchman by surprise. Okay, so, I mean, this is an incredibly daring expedition. Very much thinking outside the box. You know, this is, uh, you know, very outside the norms of naval combat. But as we've seen, Cochrane is daring. And like I said, he's always thinking. He's always got another scheme uh, and this is a very daring and impressive scheme. I guess we'll see how it goes, but I think he's set up for success here. After a brief but fierce skirmish, the British sailors prevailed, inducing the enemy's surrender. Yet things were soon to go sideways, for the shouts and uh -oh. musket fire from the melee had alerted the vessels upriver. Before Lieutenant Haswell was able to weigh Tapajuz's anchor and return to the palace, his men were intercepted by another French gun brig. A broadside gunfight ensued, in which Haswell managed to use the captured vessel's cannon to subdue <laughs> the foe. Hey, Haswell's pretty talented too. Seems like we have a, uh, you know, this subordinate is also a pretty uh, impressive leader. Despite this, the prize ship suffered damage to her rigging, stranding mm. the majority of British seamen upriver. Damn. At sunrise, the crew remaining aboard the palace itself spotted three French corvettes bearing down upon them from the coastline. Cochrane was now vulnerable, as the majority of his men were still with Haswell far upstream. At full capacity... Uh oh You know, Cochrane is very ambitious, but he might have sort of jumped in too fast, gotten himself into a situation he might not be able to pull away from. I guess we'll see. Palace could potentially outgun three corvettes, but with only a paltry 40 men on her deck, it was a hopeless fight. Mm. Thinking quickly, Cochrane ordered his skeleton crew to fasten rope yarns to the furled sails. Then, in one motion, all the yarns were cut at once, loosing all sail in one go, giving mm. off the illusion that Palace was manned by a full crew. Mm, smart. In Cochrane's own words, the maneuver succeeded to a marvel. No sooner was our cloud of canvas thus suddenly let fall than the approaching vessels hauled the wind and ran off along shore. <laughs> you know, I always like seeing, you know, what I know as sort of army uh, ground tactics replicated in a naval fashion. 
because I'm not a military historian, but I'm definitely more familiar with ground warfare than warfare at sea. This is sort of the equivalent of when you might have a smaller force than your opponent, but you send your men trooping back and forth to give the impression that you have a much larger army than you do have, or you stretch out your line way longer than it should be so that your opponent thinks, oh my, he's got a... <laughs> He's got a lot of men. Cochrane's sort of doing that, giving the impression that he's got a full crew and, you know, he's going to be a handful to deal with uh, and, you know, using that trickery to frighten his opponents away. Pallas engaged in pursuit, blasting her bow guns into the stern of the first fleeing Oh, wow. But, of course, it's not enough for Cochrane to scare his opponents away. He's going straight into the pursuit, back on the attack. That's exactly what I would have expected from him. <laughs> These were the only guns they had the ability to man, unbeknownst <laughs> to the French captain, wow. who deliberately ran his vessel aground upon the shore in a panic, the shock of the impact collapsing the vessel's mainmast. With one ship subdued, the vicious Cochrane relentlessly pursued the remaining two corvettes. Both ran themselves aground and wrecked <laughs> their vessels rather than risk battle with Pallas. Incredible. Overall, with only one frigate and a handful of boarding boats, Cochrane and his men had decommissioned four French warships and captured one. Yeah, so he, you know, thought up this scheme in the first place, very out of the box, very intelligent. And then, when it seemed like he might be in over his head, he went, no, 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 we'll be fine. Used his brain to think up another little scheme to scare them away, and then chased after them and defeated them. That's incredible. I mean, like I said before, that's daring, that's ambitious, it's intelligent, it's cunning. You know, I can see why this guy garnered such a reputation. It was a stunningly unlikely victory, yeah. won through iron will and quick wit. In the summer of 1806, Cochrane returned to Britain as a triumphant war hero, his fearless raids off the Bay of Biscay having earned him no small amount of fame. Napoleon himself, the newly crowned Emperor of France had taken an interest in this particularly prolific captain's trail of destruction. And as we know from Napoleon's Marshals, uh, that epic history TV series, Napoleon does certainly have an eye for talent. Uh, you know, Napoleon was a lot of things, but he was a good selector of talent. And personally ordered his capture, bestowing upon him a new title, Le Loup de Mer, the Sea Wolf. Oh, that's great. Never one to rest on his laurels, Cochrane was far from finished with his seaborn marauding. It All right, uh, and we're going to end part one right here. Um, you know, a bit of a sudden cutoff, but uh, it's kind of hard to avoid when you're splitting one video into three. Uh, great nickname from Napoleon. Uh, we've seen some of Cochrane's exploits during the Napoleonic Wars. We've got a while to go. I'm sure... We're going to see him do some other crazy stuff, come up with some other insane schemes. I've really enjoyed what I've seen so far. Uh, he seems like a very eccentric, interesting character. I'd be interested to learn a little more about him personally. We've heard a lot about his exploits. Um, you know, maybe a bit more on his character and personality. That'd be fascinating. Uh, he does have that sort of characteristic Scottish stubbornness and disdain for authority. <laughs> you know, I like that. I can relate in some ways. Uh, so yeah, you know, this part one was very interesting. Uh, I'm excited to watch the rest of this hour and 20 minute long video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'd appreciate it if you would tune in for the next episode. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out the Patreon and channel memberships. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.